Okay, this is Nancy Haight, and we're on live. Um, this is Death Penalty Focus. This is the fourth in our webinar series. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this Death Penalty Focus event. Um, in the series, this is the fourth of our series, and we've ex attempted to expose the truth behind the death penalty. Um, so far, we've presented district attorneys from large urban areas, and they've discussed why it is that they reject the death penalty for their jurisdictions. Um, we've presented conservative leaders who talked about rejecting the death penalty on the grounds of cost, of error, of right to life issues. Um, we've demonstrated through our various speakers that the death penalty has no value as a deterrent. It does not improve public safety. Um, and we've also explained to our viewers the complex, tangled, and error-prone uh, nature of death penalty litigation from charging clear through clemency. Um, today, we're discussing a problem of innocence and the death penalty. Um, as a, uh, today, we know there are 170 death row prisoners who have been exonerated or otherwise released from prison due to evidence that was disclosed often years later about their innocence or lack of culpability. Um, we know now that for every nine prisoners who are executed, um, one prisoner is exonerated. Uh, the question, you know, is just glaring. And the question is, how can we justify the death penalty when we have such a high risk of executing innocents? Um, today, I'd like to introduce you to our most esteemed panel, and I am happy to do that. Uh, let me start with Jessica Henry. Um, Jessica Henry, who is on my upper left here. Um, Jessica Henry is a professor at Montclair State University. Uh, she teaches criminal law and procedure. Um, she teaches current topics in criminal justice, including wrongful convictions, uh, severe sentences like the death penalty and life without parole. Um, hate crimes, and other current topics. I mean, Jessica is an author, a legal commentator, a blogger, and a social justice advocate. Um, for a little credibility for those of us who are lawyers, uh, she was a public defender in New York for 10 years, and I say cheers to that. Um, she's written numerous articles for both academic and mainstream publications. Jessica frequently appears as a commentator on national and local television and radio. Um, Jessica is the author of a newly released book called Smoke But No Fire, Convicting the Innocent of Crimes That Never Happened, and I look forward to reading that. So welcome, Jessica. And I hear the applause in the background. Okay, next we have uh, Maurice Posley, uh, who is an author, three-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, um, who works in criminal justice and has done amazing work that has directly helped and ex helped to exonerate uh, several death row inmates. Um, Maurice was an investigative journalist for 25 years with the Chicago Tribune, um, and he was working in Chicago when Governor Ryan declared the moratorium on the death penalty. This was the first time a governor had declared a moratorium on the death penalty, and this is really um, this is a critical topic and an interesting one. Uh, Maurice is the co-author with Governor Ryan on his new book, Until I Could Be Sure, How I Stopped the Death Penalty in Illinois. Um, his book is to be released September 1st of this year. Um, when I got to know Maurice, it was due to his work in uh, prosecutorial misconduct. Um, Maurice did groundbreaking research at Santa Clara University, uh, studied and wrote about prosecutorial and law enforcement misconduct, and really blew open the whole subject. Um, uh, for discussion and for investigation in for many of us in our individual cases. Um, what I really like about Maurice is that he documents the true story behind the case. I, his, you know, his stories behind the case don't look like a police report. They actually look like a true and personal story of the person who's involved in the criminal justice system. Um, Maurice's reporting has contributed to the exhaustion of numerous prisoners his writing exposed the wrongful executions in Texas of Cameron Todd Willingham and Carlos DeLuna. Welcome, Maurice Posley. Um, Simon Cole is a professor of criminology, law, and society at UC Irvine. 
He is an expert in forensic science. He's written dozens of papers about the science of fingerprinting and other areas of forensic science. Um, to me, a very interesting area of Simon's work goes beyond the science itself. Um, Simon studies and writes about ethics and morality in the courtroom application of forensic sciences, particularly where scientific evidence has a direct effect on the future of a defendant in a criminal case. Uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, Simon's work should be required reading for every forensic F expert who ever testifies in a criminal case. Um, Simon Cole is the director of the Newkirk for Science and Society at UC Irvine. He teaches a course on the death penalty and he is an editor for the National Registry of Exonerations. So welcome the three of you, such an esteemed panel. So uh, let's start off with the question, you know, what should our viewers know about innocence in the death penalty? Well, I thought I would start by, Thank you. By, by start, and thank you for that generous introduction, um, Nancy. Um, I thought I would start by giving sort of a statistical view of what we know, um, and that can tell us also what we don't know. Um, let's start with lists. So the Death Penalty Information Center, which is uh, probably the greatest aggregator of information on the death penalty in the United States, um, their website um, is just Death Penalty Information Center. You Google it and it comes right up. They have 170 cases. They go back to 1973. The registry has 127. The primary difference is that the registry, um, which captures exonerations in all cases, not just death penalty cases, um, starts in January 1st, 1989. Um, that was basically selected because it was um, the year of the first DNA exoneration and seemed like a logical sort of fence post to start and move forward from because we ushered in the DNA era in the criminal justice system. Um, we also, uh, on the registry, have a separate website for cases prior to 1989. There are 91 death row exonerations in that um, database, which is more limited because older cases, documents are a little bit, a lot harder to find. And, and so for statistical analysis, we use the cases from 1989 forward, 127. Um, just a little demographic information, um, two are women uh, and 125 are men. Um, 68 were black, um, that's 54%. Uh, 45 are white, that's another 35% and 12 are Hispanic, about 9%. Um, the youngest was Leon Brown out of North Carolina who was 15 at the time of the crime. He was convicted and sentenced to death. Um, DNA has played a role in 31 of these exonerations of the 127. And what that really tells us is um, how difficult, because without DNA, it's much more difficult to obtain uh, an exoneration and how difficult these cases are to get into the posture where you can show that someone is innocent and should be exonerated. Um, so how do they wind up there? Well, we track what we call contributing factors. These are things that went wrong in cases that caused someone to be wrongfully convicted. Um, in these 127, mistaken witness identification um, was involved in 30 cases. That's uh, 24%. Um, false confessions uh, was involved in 25 of the cases. That's 20%. And some of these cases have multiple, multiple factors. Um, and these are all things that you can find yourself on our website. It's a very searchable uh, website. Um, false or misleading forensic evidence was involved in 45 cases, that's 35%. The two leading causes of wrongful conviction in death penalty cases are perjury and false accusation which is, was involved in 94 of the 127, that's 74%, and official misconduct, which was involved in 100 or nearly 80% of the cases. 
And really, official misconduct is a is a somewhat broad term, but it basically refers to uh, acts of official public uh, officials like police, prosecutors, forensic and analysts, that sort of thing. It largely falls into the categories of police and prosecutors. And what this tells you that nearly 80% of these wrongful convictions and death penalty cases involved official misconduct. What that really tells us is how the stakes are high and the pressure is on to win. And um, this misconduct ranges from failing to reveal exculpatory evidence, evidence that shows, tends to show the innocence uh, of a uh, defendant to um, misconduct in interrogation rooms to perjury on the witness stand. Um, it's, it's a fairly significant uh, range of, of misconduct. And to th when you step back and say almost 80% of these um, cases, wrongful convictions involved this sort of misconduct, you start to think, well, maybe this is where we should devote some efforts to make change to prevent this sort of misconduct. Um, 29 of the cases, or 23% uh, involved jailhouse informants, which is just notoriously bad information. Um, there have been death row exonerations since 1989 in 25 states. Uh, Illinois, with 19, has more than any other state. Um, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Louisiana and Texas both have had 11. Florida has had 10 and there are four states with eight. Arizona, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. That means eight states have 73 of these uh, exonerations, well, more than half, almost 60% of the total. So when you come back to Illinois for a second, Cook County, which is Chicago, uh, has had 13 death row exonerations since 1989. That's more than double of any other county in the country. Um, Orleans Parish in Louisiana and Philadelphia uh, County have had five each. They're, that's, that's how close they come. And of these states we're talking about here, only Illinois has abolished the death penalty. Um, and innocence really was the moving factor. Um, from 1989 through 1998, there were 24 death row exonerations in this country. And then George Ryan was elected governor in 1999. By that time, there had been seven death row exonerations in Illinois. And in 1999, there was um, another one in Illinois, and there were, or three in Illinois, and there were six total in the nation. So when there was another one in Illinois in his first year in office, he, as Nancy mentioned, imposed a moratorium on the death penalty and basically said, until I can be sure um, that we're not gonna execute an innocent person, there are gonna be no more executions under my watch. Um, and the exonerations continued to pile up. In fact, 45% of all of our death row exonerations since 1989 occurred in the decade from 1999 to, to, to 2009. And then in 2003, when Governor Ryan was leaving office and the Illinois legislature had failed to enact any of the um, proposals that his commission that he had appointed to, let's restructure this, let's revamp the system, let's try to prevent these things from happening. Um, none of it had been enacted. And so he emptied death row. He commuted, he pardoned four death row inmates on the basis of actual innocence and commuted the sentences of 100, death sentences of 167 others. It's still, it was and is the largest commutation of death row in our nation's history. Um, those people were all alive to be commuted. Uh, those people were alive who were exonerated. Um, we have a few people, we all have a portion of our website uh, that deals with the longest ex time spent in prison from conviction to exoneration. And some of these are people that were on death row. Um, Charles Finch in North Carolina and Clifford Williams in Florida spent 42 years in prison before they were exonerated. And Wiley Bridgman and Ricky Jackson in Ohio, 39 years. Paul Browning 
uh, in Arizona. Was it Arizona or Utah? We spent 32 years. But all these these were still alive because along the way their sentences were reduced, commuted to life, or they got new sentencing hearings. And on a sentencing hearing redo, they were sentenced to life. And so they were actually alive so they could be exonerated. Otherwise, um, they would be dead. They would have been dead. Um, and so that's kind of a snapshot of what the registry has. Um, and of course, we're now approaching 2,700 exonerations. Um, and so the death row is a, a fraction of those, but of course, those are the ones where the sentence, um, had it been imposed, there'd be 127 people who'd be dead. You're on mute, Nancy. That's an amazing set of statistics. Um, Jessica? Hi. Um, thanks, Maurice, for that wonderful overview of just how devastating the, the situation is. Um, you know, one of the things I think is so interesting is whether we use the data that comes out of the Death Penalty Information Center, um, one in nine, or whether we use sort of other statistical analyses of how often people are wrongly convicted and exonerated um, from death sentences. Sam Gross has a study from 2004 that offers the statistic of 4.1% of all people who, if they were sentenced to death and had remained under a sentence to death, 4.1% of them would have been exonerated. Um, but the truth is we don't really know. We don't know how many people have been sentenced to die and have either been executed or have had some intervention occur so that they weren't executed. But this is not a new problem, right? I mean, we can go all the way back in history. We can go to the Salem witch trials, which in the 16, late 1600s, where people were put to death for the crime of being witches, which of course we know they weren't. Um, or even flash forward a little bit more, the first sort of what most people call the first known wrongful conviction occurred in 1812. Well, it was actually 1819 when they were convicted, but in 1812, um, two brothers, the Bourne brothers, Stephen and Jesse Bourne, um, they were living in Vermont and their brother-in-law went missing and everyone assumed he had been murdered and that the brothers had committed the crime. And what's so fascinating, if you look at this case, it could have happened in 2020. There was an informant, there was bad forensics, there was a false confession that was somehow, you know, driven out of these brothers. Um, and then on the eve of their execution, as they were, one of the brothers was being marched to the gallows, uh, it was discovered that the brother-in-law was alive and well in my native state of New Jersey. And so that, you know, we have this history of people who have been sentenced to death. Um, and we just don't have a, a really great idea of how often people are wrongly convicted and sentenced to die and executed. And of course, none of the databases um, keep track of lynchings which are extrajudicial killings, right? They're not, they're not technically death sentences because they're not being imposed by the state. But we know thousands of people were lynched for crimes that they were accused of committing, but of course never did. Um, and so, so the problem of innocence and death sentences is one that has existed for as long as we have had capital punishment, which is as long as we have had this country in place. And so, the fact that in 2020 we are still discussing it is problematic, but it's also exciting because more and more people are joining the national conversation to say, we don't need this punishment. Um, and here's all the reasons why. And innocence is definitely one that has brought folks from both sides of the aisle together to say, yeah, there's something really wrong with the penalty where the government can execute somebody who's innocent. It's definitely interesting, and the idea that now we have such strong statistics certainly enhances and illustrates the problem in a persuasive way. So, Simon? Uh, thank you. I'm going to um, share my screen, if that's all right, because um, I need PowerPoint as a crutch to talk. Um, uh, I just wanted to show a couple slides that I uh, that I use with my students in my the death penalty class that I teach at um, UC Irvine, and and I I start out by um, talking to them about why they're for why they might be for or against the death penalty, and I tell them that you know they have a lot of different 
dimensions to choose from. There are sort of moral or religious reasons to be for or against uh, the death penalty or political reasons, or you could be concerned about discrimination, which might include race, uh, class, arbitrariness, um, or there are practical reasons, like you believe it's a deterrent or you believe it's not a deterrent. Um, and uh, innocence, I think, fits into um, the practical sort of category as a reason to be, um, to, as a reason for abolition, that you think it doesn't work, it catches the wrong people, um, it, uh, it um, is responsible for the execution of innocent people, which nobody is really, is really for. Um, and so if you look at the history of the death penalty debate in the United States, you see kind of the, these, um, these rationales kind of go in and out of vogue. You know, deterrence was really important at one time and then it kind of wasn't. Um, and, and I would argue that during the decades following the year 2000, um, innocence kind of came to the fore and eclipsed other arguments. And in fact, there's even um, a book about this by Frank Baumgartner and his um, colleagues um, arguing that innocence was really, had really become the kind of salient issue about um, the death penalty. And I think during that decade, um, abolitionists uh, really thought they had in innocence a kind of winning issue for persuading people because um, while some people might be for the death penalty, almost nobody is for the death penalty for innocent people, right? Um, and yet, you know, the argument is always sort of strange um, to be against the death penalty because of the execution of innocence, um, because it, it means you're sort of against it because it has errors. Um, and uh, it kind of makes you wonder, well, why would you expect that we would have a death penalty system that wouldn't have errors? I mean, do you really think we could build a perfect um, death penalty system? Um, that seems kind of unrealistic. So why are you upset that there are um, some errors in, in the system? And it might be that the answer to that is that it's not just that there are some errors, but it's the magnitude of the errors, that, that there's so many errors that that um, bothered people. And so during the 2000s, you had, as Maurice mentioned, um, Governor Ryan um, acting perhaps primarily because of um, innocence in issuing his moratorium. Maurice said it was probably the leading reason, um, although there were certainly others. And, and early in that decade, in 2002, you had the, um, the federal court case, United States versus Canones, in which a federal judge for the first time rules the death penalty unconstitutional. And his pr primary rationale for that was the potential likelihood of um, executing an innocent person. And um, the judge in that case, Judge Rakoff, um, sort of reasoned from evidence about DNA exonerations and some studies by Jim Liebman and, and colleagues about innocent people discovered on death row. And he kind of reasoned that we had come so close to executing undisputably innocent people um, that we knew about that it was sure that we probably had executed some innocent people and it was sure that we probably would ex execute some innocent people if we continued to have the death penalty. And that's why he ruled it unconstitutional. Um, that was quickly reversed by the Second Circuit. Uh, so it wasn't un unconstitutional for very long. Um, but it was a sign of the importance of this uh, innocence argument. Um, and, and so this argument that, well, I can't point to the innocent person that we've executed, although later in the presentation, some, some co-panelists might point to such a person. Um, we've come so close to executing undisputably innocent people that there must be some innocent people that we don't know about that we either have executed or are about to. And um, many of the known innocent death row exonerees kind of illustrate this because of the serendipity with which they were exonerated. And just some examples, um, you know, the, the Brian Stevenson Just Mercy movie came out recently. So um, that's a good case for that, um, where if somebody flipped over a, a cassette tape and found the evidence of, of that client, Walter McMillan's innocence. Um, Kirk Bloodsworth 
almost surely would have been executed had DNA evidence not been invented um, before in order to prevent his execution. Um, Anthony Porter is a is a good good example of this of someone who whose um, death sentence was not carried out because of an issue totally unrelated to innocence. It was about a mental competency issue um, and then was exonerated because of innocence. Or Randall Adams, who's in the, the sort of original wrongful conviction movie, The Thin Blue Line. Um, you have a filmmaker come and make a movie about you that, um, that, that proves you innocence, innocent. And um, this is why you may have heard kind of the old adage that if you do happen to be an innocent person uh, accused of murder, um, and we see a lot of such people in the National Registry of Exonerations, um, that in some ways the best thing that could happen to you would be to be charged with the death penalty because of um, the amount of attention that your case will get um, all the way through. And again, um, the Brian Stevenson case involving Walter McMillan kind of illustrates this where um, it probably really is only because he got the death sentence that he got Brian Stevenson as a lawyer and was able to be exonerated. We probably wouldn't know about this case or about his innocence had that not happened. And in fact, um, he didn't get a death sentence from the jury. He got a death sentence from the judge in a so-called judicial override, um, which are these controversial provisions which only exist in a handful of, of states um, in which the judge can override a non-death sentence that's given by, um, by a jury. Um, uh, and so the, I just want to say, the last thing I want to note is that um, in a way, innocence has kind of um, been been superseded as uh, the key debate in the death penalty, probably since around 2008 um, and the recession, as cost kind of came to the fore. Um, and uh, it is pretty clear that abolitionists kind of switched from innocence to cost um, as what they thought it, they they saw as. Um, as the winning argument. Again, another kind of practical reason where people um, can say, you know, I'm for the death penalty in principle, but I'm not for it the way it's administered in this country because of, um, because of the uh, enormous costs we have for the, um, um, to, to get this very small number of um, executions. And you can see that in our own state of California where the proposition to abolish the death penalty um, was um, uh, the abolitionist uh, case for it was founded almost entirely on, on cost arguments and not um, uh, innocence. So um, I just wanted to take another second to show you the registry website. I think I have to stop sharing and then reshare. All right, so um, someone asked uh, where our website was in the in the um, chat, and so um, I just wanted to show you the the website, which uh, Maurice talked about some of the statistics from it and how you can get those statistics. Um, Nancy, I'm assuming people can see the registry website now. Is that is that right? Okay. Um, so uh, there are two ways, uh, two easy ways of accessing our data. This um, this map here will come up if you go to the website and choose interactive data display. And this is kind of a nice display where you, um, um, those statistics that Maurice just gave you, you can find them for yourself. Um, we have about 2,600 exonerations since 1989. You have a map of the United States of where they occur. Um, Texas is in its rightful place as having the most um, number of exonerations. Um, but if you're interested in the death penalty, you can come over here and select death sentence present. Um, and the, uh, the map will update and we get the 127 exonerations that Maurice mentioned. And as he mentioned, um, Texas drops out of first place and Illinois um, goes up into first place. Um, the race, gender, and gender statistics um, that Maurice was mentioning can all be found over here. And the contributing factor 
statistics can be found um, up here. And you can um, select for one of these, and that'll give you um, the cases with that contributing factor. So if I do that, I'll get the 100 exonerations um, involving official misconduct that Maurice just mentioned. Um, and if you get out a, a paper and pencil, you can compute the percentages for death penalty cases versus all exonerations. And Maurice gave you the percentages. Um, and, and as he mentioned, one case can have more than one contributing factor. Um, those contributing factors are higher for death penalty cases for every single one of these contributing factors except for mistaken identification. Um, and maybe that just says more bad stuff happens in death penalty cases. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, and then down here, you can uh, even look at um, how many cases in each year. And down to each, each box here is a case, and you can see um, the actual case. Uh, as Maurice mentioned, we also have a before 1989 registry, and then we have the main registry, which is since 1989. And if you don't like this map, you can get the exact same information by going to the detailed view. We have two views, the detailed view and the summary view. And you can go to the detailed view, and if you want death penalty cases, you can filter the sentence sentences. So we go all the way down to the bottom and we see death sentences. And now um, I've reduced the database to the 127 um, death cases. And then I can come over here and look at the contributing factors again and filter the cases by the contributing factors. Um, or other things, I can filter by county, um, by race, age, um, and certain tags that we have um, labeled up here. Simon, before you leave this page, would you please click on one of these um, one of these cases just so that our viewers can see the extent of information uh, that's in here in the National Registry for every case? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for answering for asking that because um, the the registry is not just a bunch of data. Um, each case, every single case, all uh, two thousand six hundred cases, um, has a narrative. Um, an astonishing large, astonishingly large proportion of them written by Maurice. Um, and um, this is, a, uh, and so every single case has a story. Um, they vary in length, but, um, but I chose this one because it was recently written in um, California death case. Very complicated case. Um, this, is, this is an especially long narrative, but Maurice has told um, the entire story of this case in detail here. Um, uh, what happened to this person, why they were suspected, how they, how they were exonerated. Um, and and this, one, this one, in fact, um, ben, Benavides, um, I don't know if we're going to talk about him later, but um, it's, an, it's an incredible case, um, both in terms of, I mean, it's, a, it's an upsetting case, but it's, it's, an, it's an amazing case in terms of both the conviction and the exoneration. Oh, do you want to tell us a little about it? No, I'll let Maurice do that. Okay. But. It, it is it's so interesting, and the fact that there are so many cases of innocence, um, it really just gives us pause about the nature of the criminal justice system to start, but also the terror that truly is the death penalty. So with that, a few things. Um, please enter your questions in the Q&A box, and we will get to those towards the end of the session. And... Um, we're monitoring your questions, so don't think that they'll, you know, get lost down the drain. So uh, do we want to talk about cases now? Sure, sure. Okay, great. Go ahead. Well, um, I can talk about um, the Benavides case very briefly, but I was going to talk about the Cameron Todd Willingham case because that was a case that um, myself and Steve Mills at the Chicago Tribune um, worked on, and, and sadly, we came to that case uh, several months after he'd been executed. Uh, he was executed in Texas in 2004 for uh, setting a fire that killed his three infant daughters um, back in 1991. Uh, and sort of the background of this was the Tribune 
when I was there, myself, Steve Mills, and Ken Armstrong, over a period of years, were given the, had the luxury of sort of just going at, taking apart the criminal justice system. And we did series of series um, on uh, prosecutorial misconduct, false and coerced confessions. Um, in 2000, we did a series of articles called Executions in America, where we examined a, about a half a dozen cases where the, the evidence was very strong that uh, innocent people had been executed. And in early, in, in 2004, we began working on a series on uh, forensics, um, good forensics used badly and bad forensics used badly. Um, and as part of it, we did a, a day on arson and how the science was beginning to emerge from days of folklore where, you know, people got confessions from people and then went back and figured out that based on what they found in the rubble, there must have been an arson. Um, and after we published this series, we th thought, I wonder if anybody's been executed in the US who'd been convicted of arson, not that they killed someone and set a fire to cover it up, but where arson was the weapon. And it turned out that Willingham was the one. And when we went down and looked at that case it's in Corsicana, uh, Texas, um, what we found was pretty astonishing based on what we had learned about the lack of science in arson investigations. And he had been convicted basically uh, uh, on the basis of an arson investigator who said he had investigated something like 2,500 fires, almost all of them were arson, and he had never been wrong. So when you get that kind of hubris, um, and what we did was we took, um, there was a video of the walkthrough of the post uh, after it had been extinguished, uh, the interior, and um, all the reports, and we sent them to um, several arson experts independently, and they all concluded that the expert, the arson expert's conclusion was based on false science. Um, and of course, you can't dig them up and put the paddles on him. He's dead. Um, but that, and we published an article right before the end of the year in 2004. And, you know, as we've seen since the, actually the Innocence Project in New York took up uh, on uh, sort of a posthumous uh, behalf uh, for uh, Willingham. There's been at least one documentary, one feature film, the New Yorker magazine did a huge piece on David Gran. Um, and the Texas uh, Forensic Science Commission was established. And I think that the Willingham case was a leading factor in that um, to examine not just arson cases, but other cases of bad science. And Simon can really speak to you know, sort of bad science in the courtrooms a lot more authoritatively than I can. Um, but, um, you know, Willingham was just sort of a case that really flew under the radar. Um, and there is a case that's in the registry of uh, an arson case that was subsequently uh, exonerated in Texas before he could uh, be executed, the Willis case um, from Pecos County. Um, where he got a new trial, not because of the science, but because he was deemed to be not uh, mentally uh, able to communicate effectively with his lawyers because he was, I want to say he was some schizophrenic, he was denied his medicine, but he was, and so he got a new trial, and when, upon the new trial, because of this emerging body of evidence about the bad science, they got some of the same experts that looked at the Willingham case to look at the Willis case and they concluded not an arson, accident. And he, um, so you basically have, you know, two results. And one guy went this way to the uh, execution chamber and the other guy, Willis, eventually got freed. Um, and, you know, talk about some of the serendipity that, that Simon mentioned. 
And I'll just Thank briefly, you. I'll just briefly mention the Benavides case in a nutshell, but I rec I commend it to you. It's one of the more egregious cases. It's a California case. Um, California doesn't exonerate many. I think there's been three death row exonerations in, in, that are in the database in California. This was a guy who was convicted and sentenced to death for raping his child to death. And I can't, I, I can't say it any other way than that. And years later, um, through the work of the federal defender and a bunch of lawyers, they showed that all the evidence that was used to prove that he had committed this egregious crime was the result of medical procedures by physicians and others trying to save the child's life. It's just horrible. Um, and this poor guy who, you know, he was not well educated. He was very sort of um, low IQ, um, wasn't fluent. Um, and he just, away he went and he's a lucky man that he, had a legal team that he did um, that were able to get the experts to come in. And finally, even some of the physicians conceded that, yes, this is what happened, that what we did here generated the physical injuries that were later attributed to Vicente. It's just a tragedy. It's, it's just amazing, isn't it? The, the combination of uh, government misconduct, uh, bad science, um, you know, other bad things too, like false confessions and all eyewitness ID. All of those are really, um, are just problems that seem to be inherent in the way our system works. So Simon, you are an expert in this. So why don't you tell us a little more? Hmm. I think Jessica was next. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Jessica. Go ahead. It doesn't matter what order we go in. And you know, Maurice, I was just thinking when you said that, um, Sabrina Butler is one of the women um, who was on Mississippi's death row, and she was also convicted of murdering her child. Um, and the evidence they used were injuries that now, that they later believed were sustained by the child when she was trying to revive him using CPR. So it's the same kind of um, story, it just reminded me. Um, and Maurice was telling us about Karen Todd Willingham, who was executed. And thankfully, we do have stories, and there are other unfortunate stories of people who were, um, who are with strong innocence of innocence, with strong evidence of innocence, were executed nonetheless, like Troy Davis um, or Carlos De Luna, which is another one of the cases that Maurice wrote so beautifully about. Um, but there are thankfully cases, and I say thankfully because still so many years were squandered on death row under horrific conditions, um, but we do know of a number of cases where people were wrongly convicted and sentenced to death and ultimately exonerated. And I wanna talk about one of them um, because not only does it highlight forensic error, which it does, but it also highlights for me one of the major issues that we see time and again, which is poverty and race. Um, I don't think you can talk about anything to do with the criminal justice system without talking about race and poverty. Um, the death penalty only amplifies that conversation because I don't think you find virtually anyone on death row who has money and resources. Um, and the case I wanted to, to talk with all of us about today is Rodriguez Crawford out of Louisiana. Um, he was a 19 year old back in 2012. Um, he had a small child. Uh, he lives in a home in Shreveport with his family. The baby's mother lived down the road from him. Um, by all accounts, Rodriguez Crawford was a great guy. He, was a, he loved to dance. He was a great dad. He was very dedicated to his child. And one morning when the baby was sleeping at his home, he woke up and the baby was not responsive. Rodriguez was not responsive. And the family member called 911 repeatedly. And 911 took its sweet time getting there and later tapes were um, shared where you hear the dispatch making unbelievably condescending remarks about, oh, well, they must have just slept over there, slept on the baby and they're acting like damn fools. Um, and when the paramedics and EMT arrived at the scene, they had already decided that foul play was the cause of this baby's death. Um, in fact, one of the paramedics called it a crime scene. Another claimed to see injuries on the babies that only she could see 
weren't revealed in the autopsy or anywhere else. Um, and when the um, first responders arrived, they took the baby and put the baby into an ambulance and locked the doors and called the police. And it took the family um, sort of banging on the ambulance doors to say what's going on and the police arriving before they were even told that the child in fact was dead. Um, and then the police, instead of treating Rodriguez Crawford like the grieving father that he was, whisked him off to the police station and interrogated him for hours and then charged him with murder. And he was ultimately, um, and then the, the, sorry, the big part of the story that I almost forgot, is the medical examiner, without waiting for the lab results, decided that the child had been murdered. And even though the lab results came back showing pneumonia and sepsis were in the baby's lungs, the medical examiner determined that was just a coincidence and it was clear that the baby had been killed. Um, and the jury believed that, credited that story. He, um, Rodriguez Crawford was sent to death row. Uh, eventually, eventually, his version of events, Rodriguez Crawford's version of events was, um, was sustained by a court and he was exonerated, um, but not until he had served many years on Louisiana's notorious death row in Ancola, um, all for a murder that didn't happen, um, that was an actual, a, an illness-related death. Um, and so much of that had to do with race and poverty and the way that the system viewed him as a criminal defendant from the outset. Thank you for that. And that's the topic of your book, isn't it? No crime, crime. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and you know, it's not, it's, it, I was thinking about, in, in thinking about this webinar today, so many stories in my book are capital cases, and not because my book focuses exclusively on the death penalty, but because it comes up so frequently. And, you know, so we just talked about briefly Sabrina Butler, and we I just shared the story of Rodriguez Crawford, but, you know, there are so many other people Charles Robbins, who goes, um, who, who's since changed his name, um, but he, he was also convicted of murdering his child. He was also sent to death row. I think he spent 26 or 27 years on Nevada's death row. Um, he's not in anybody's exoneration list because he ultimately, once um, exculpatory evidence was revealed that showed that the baby who he was convicted of murdering had actually died of an illness, sort of a similar scenario, only this baby had died of an illness that could have been diagnosed um, had his defense lawyer done any work. Um, once it was revealed that the baby had died of scurvy and the prosecutor's own expert reviewing the case again agreed that the baby had died with scurvy. So this is not a question mark. The prosecutor said, hey, rather than making me retry you, why don't you just take a plea and we'll give you time served. And he took the plea deal. So he's a convicted felon even though all the evidence points to an accidental death of his child and that no crime had ever been committed in the first place. So troubling. It's, it's horrible. And it goes again back to the issues that we are talking about, about poverty, about race, about access to representation, um, about how we see people, how we treat people, how we value lives. It's, it's, it's a hugely important thing we need to consider when we're talking about um, the criminal justice system broadly and the death penalty specifically. And Maurice, you had a comment? I was just going to say that um, so my fellow researcher Ken Otterberg and I have a list of about 600 cases nationally that are in some form of posture that where they've gotten new trials um, or they have filed serious motions for post-conviction relief and we try to keep track of these to see if these cases wind up qualifying for the registry. And um, it's really kind of depressing, uh, although it's very understandable, um, where people get a new trial and they get that offer. And they know that if they're gonna, if the state wants to, they can drag out a retrial for a year, two years, and then you're rolling the dice with another jury, even with your new evidence. Um, and you're given that offer and if you spent 25 or 30 years protesting your innocence and now you have a whiff of freedom, uh, I can understand why they, you know, will take what's known as an Alford plea. It's basically saying, I will 
admit that the state has evidence that could result in my conviction, but I will not. I maintain my innocence throughout this plea um, for their freedom. Um, and there's hundreds of those cases that happen. Um, and if it's a death penalty case, it's exponentially ratcheted up in terms of the pressure. And so, um, as I said, it's, it's another tragedy, but it's understandable. You know, if you're 50 years old or 60, 55 years old and you've spent 25 or 30 years in prison, you're looking at, you know, uh, I, I'm on the downhill slope here, you know, um, and how do I want to risk the rest of my life and how do I want to spend it? Do I want to be a convicted felon and free or do I want to risk spending the rest of my life? But if I could just, you know, it's understandable from the defendant's point of view, from the person who's innocent, who's been, you know, living in deprivation and these horrible conditions on death row for however many years, one year is too many, let alone 25. Um, but what I've never understood and what I think we should all be shocked about and outraged about is the prosecutors that insist on getting their pound of flesh in whatever form they can. When there's compelling innocent evidence of innocence, they shouldn't be in insisting that, well, you got to take the plea or I'm going to retry you, which is going to take two years. And I know you're poor because you've been on death row and not earning any capital for however long. So you're just going to have to sit because you won't be able to make bail, even if bail is set for you. So it becomes this really coercive situation where people plead guilty um, to get out when they're innocent and prosecutors and judges all go along with it. Um, it, so it is really prosecutorial misconduct, in my opinion. So. It's egregious behavior, I think, when there's that kind of compelling evidence for prosecutors to insist, um, you know, to, to present what's essentially a Hobbesian choice. I mean, you know, you either, you either take the plea or you roll your dice, as Maurice said, um, and wait in, in prison or jail before it happens. Indeed, indeed. I mean, the extent of prosecutorial misconduct is just overwhelming. And the fact that there is so little accountability for that is distressing and truly needs to change. So, Simon, you want to you want to continue? Uh, you sure. Yeah, I wanted uh, to talk about a case involving um, forensic science. Although, uh, actually, the case involves a lot of a lot of things other than that. And I, I picked the Glenn Ford case. Um, this is a, um, Glenn Ford was convicted of the murder of a jeweler named Isidore Roseman in 1983 in, in Shreveport, Louisiana. Roseman was shot in an apparent robbery and Ford did, um, did yard work for Roseman, so, so he knew him. Um, and so there's a variety of forensic evidence in the case. Um, their handwriting analysis um, said that Ford wrote pawn slips for um, Roseman's um, stuff. Um, and then a woman named Marvella Brown implicated her own boyfriend, Jake Robinson, his brother, Henry Robinson, a man named George Starks, and Ford um, in the robbery. Um, Ford was uh, tried separately first, and so then the first thing you do is you remove all the black people from the jury. So um, an all-white jury was impaneled. And so this, this raises a Batson issue. This audience is probably familiar with Batson issues about um, racial discrimination in jury selection. Um, if, if you want to hear more about it, there's a recent segment by John Oliver on the show last week tonight. Um, and there's also a great episode of the podcast, More Perfect, um, where they interview Mr. Batson and the prosecutor from the original Batson case, um, which is really interesting. Um, Brown recanted her accusation on the stand during Ford's trial, um, but there's forensic evidence against Ford. There was gunshot residue on Ford's hands, uh, according to the expert, and the coroner testifies that the shooter was left-handed, Ford is left-handed, the Robinsons are not, and puts the time of death at the time when witnesses saw Ford near the store. And then there's the fingerprint case, which is what I was, I'm primarily interested in. Um, there's a fingerprint on a paper bag at the crime scene. The fingerprint examiner, a guy named Billy Lockwood, um, excludes the Robinsons as the source of this print, but not Ford. Now, he doesn't say Ford is the source of the print, but he says he's not excluded. 
And uh, it's a very unusual case in that he excludes based on the pattern type, um, not on looking at the actual details of the print. The print was of so poor quality that all he could really see was the pattern type. Um, there are three basic pattern types, arches, loops, and whirls. He says it's a whirl. And the Robinsons don't have whirls on any of their 20 fingers, the two brothers, um, which is unusual. Whirls are in about 30% of fingerprints. but um, And so he can exclude them, but not, um, uh, not Robinson. Um, and then uh, you have a documentation issue. The, the examiner uh, has preserved no notes and no photographs of this print. Um, so this, regardless of what you think of the science, this is like a documentation problem. The evidence is just, it's gone. Um, Ford's defense is that yes, he did pawn the, um, the items, so in fact, the handwriting examiner is apparently correct that it was his handwriting, um, but he got them from the Robinsons. He had nothing to do with the murder. He's convicted and sentenced to death, and after that, the charges against the other three defendants, the Robinson brothers and Starks, are dismissed. Um, his uh, ordinary direct appeals are denied. In 2000, a habeas hearing is ordered by the Louisiana Supreme Court. Um, and Ford makes the following arguments. He has a defense expert who rebuts the coroner's testimony, just says these are wrong conclusions about the time of death and the handedness. Um, the gunshot residue, defense gunshot residue, um, says, and this is uh, illustrative of gunshot residue testimony, yes, you can test positive for gunshot residue if you held a gun and fired it. You can also test gu gun positive for gunshot residue from being around um, uh, from being in a police station because there's a lot of gunshot residue lying around and you can get it in your hands and they didn't test him till more than 24 hours after the crime. So it could have come from uh, the police station. So that this is a false positive and should have some resonance with the kind of COVID false positives and false negatives on all the tests that people are talking about these day days. You can get a positive result that isn't necessarily indicative of what you think um, it's from. Um, ineffective assistance of counsel. His lawyers were inexperienced. They didn't call any defense experts at trial, um, and they didn't know that they could subpoena family members from out of state, so they didn't. Um, but most importantly, there was a police report withheld in which informants said it was the only the Robinsons who did it. Um, the police uh, attributed statements to Ford from the interrogation that he apparently didn't make and didn't turn over the conflicting statements by Marvella Brown. Um, and then back to the fingerprint, um, Lockwood told the investigator he couldn't see the center of the pattern. The defense fingerprint expert, a guy named William Bailey says, well, if you don't have the center, first of all, you could mistake a whirl for a loop. So saying I know this print is a whirl was not correct. And second, you could have subclassified the whirl because actually there's at least four different types of whirl. And if you could have subclassified the whirl, maybe you could have eliminated Ford, excluded Ford as the print. But of course, Bailey can't give an opinion about whose print it is because the print is gone. There are no photographs and no notes. Um, so I was interested in this case as an example of what I've called other fingerprint errors. We, we classically, when we think of a fingerprint error in an exoneration case, we think of saying someone's the source of the print when they're not. An example of this from the registry, the most recent one is the Benaya Dandridge case. Somebody said he was the source of the print that he turned out not to be. Um, but in this article on the bottom right here by myself and Barry Sheck, we talk about other kinds of errors with fingerprints that can hurt innocent defendants too, other kinds of mistakes that can be made. Like for example, if you erroneously exclude some alternate suspect as the source of the print, um, the innocent defendant can be hurt by that. And that's sort of what happened in this case. The Robins were apparently erroneously or at least controversially excluded as the source of this this print, which allows the case against Ford to be stronger. So we call it a sort of non-consensus exclusion. 
Um, so it's an interesting way in which the fingerprint, uh, a different kind of fingerprint error can hurt an innocent um, defendant. Be that as it may, his habeas motion is denied in 2004. 2012, Caddo Parish begins reinvestigating the case. They discover um, the informant who said that Robinson admitted to shooting Roseman. And in 2014, the DA moves to dismiss the charges against Ford. The judge agrees. He's released in 2004. 2015, he's denied compensation um, because uh, the statute says, well, you can't have at all um, been involved in the crime. And the judge thinks Ford, well, at least knew about the crime. He did pawn the items. He tried to sell the murder weapon. So he's ineligible for state compensation. Um, and he dies that year. So he had very little time outside of prison as a free man. Um, perhaps the most extraordinary thing about this case, however, was the aftermath of the case in which the prosecute, trial prosecutor took the extraordinary step, and many of you may have heard of this case, of publishing an apology in the Shreveport um, Times, uh, since we were just talking about prosecutorial misconduct and so on, and um, really said some um, incredible things um, in this sort of mea culpa article about his role in the, in the Ford case. Um, at the bottom here, we have, I now realize all too painfully that as a young 33-year-old prosecutor, I was not capable of making a decision that could have led to the killing of another human being. I was not a very nice person. I had no business trying a death a case for the state. Um, this guy's name is Marty Stroud, by the way. Um, and, and over here, the striking of the African-American jurors. Um, uh, the do, uh, I participated in placing the dubious testimony of a forensic pathologist that the shooter had to be left-handed um, in front of the jury. Um, all too late, um, I learned that the testimony was pure junk science at its evil worst. Um, and then he says, I was arrogant, judgmental, narcissistic, and very full of myself. I was not as interested in justice as I was of winning. Um, so. Well, it seems like that's certainly the case in so many cases that we see, that the prosecution is out purely for a conviction, and in death penalty cases, they are out purely for a death sentence. Whether whether it's justified or not. Um, one of the subjects that people ask about is the question of um, false confession. And I've, I've had false confession cases of my own. And the question that jurors and others ask is, why would someone who committed a crime or did not commit a crime admit to committing a crime? And because these confessions have such weight in court, um, how do we explain that? I'll take a crack at that. Um, from the perspective of, um, we did a series of articles on false and coerced confessions when I was at the Chicago Tribune. And um, we found um, young people, people who are mentally impaired, people who are um, high, they're drunk, they're high in drugs. Um, People are, in Chicago, we had, people were tortured, uh, physically tortured into false, uh, falsely confessing to, to murders. Um, I had a fellow say, well, um, they basically told me I wasn't getting out of this room and, until I said what they wanted them to say. And so I figured I would go to court and tell the judge the truth and they'd let me go. Well, that doesn't happen. Um, you can actually look in the registry and see how many people um, falsely confessed. I mentioned the number in the death penalty cases, but the number is much higher. Um, Chicago is, uh, again, a leader um, in, in that department. Uh, a lot of it is because of the torture cases. Um, Peter Neufeld uh, has compared, said that Chicago is to false confessions what Cooperstown is to baseball. Um, it is the Hall of Fame. 
people, um, you know, there's been a lot that's been written about the read technique, which is a, uh, a technique of interrogation that has different steps where you basically break a person down to where they feel like the only hope they have is to admit to the crime. People are interrogated for long periods of time. It's legal to lie to them. The police can lie to them. We've got your DNA. We've got your. We've got a witness who put you there. Um, we've found your fingerprints. Um, we documented uh, cases where uh, there was a case where, as a 17-year-old kid, was in jail at the time, and they still got him to confess, and they got him a conviction. Um, and that speaks to the power of a confession. Um, and it's a difficult curve um, to get around as a juror, um, especially if you've got it um, recorded. You know, there's a case in Chicago um, where it was a kid, 19 or 18, who they have a video recording of him confessing to killing his mother. And it wasn't him. It was, he was a kid who had some serious mental issues and it was someone else and they did, they proved it by DNA. Um, you know, when, when um, the first, you know, Illinois was one of the first states by legislation to uh, say, you've got to record interrogations, not just the confession itself, but the actual interrogations. And police kept we're arguing about that saying, well, they're taking away, they're, they're, the bad guys are going to learn all our techniques and so they'll never confess. And that's just not true. And in fact, recording of interrogations is a, is a great tool to prevent false confessions. And it sh secures convictions because the legitimacy of what is said in there is now recorded. It's not based on what some police officer said happened. Um, and you know, when you get into a swearing contest in court, whether it's in front of a judge or in front of a jury, um, guess who wins? Um, the guy with the badge and the gun, not the person, you know, with the pinstripes, not to, you know, use a, an outdated term, but um, the, the pressures um, that can be brought to bear. There's a great video that you can find online involving a case out of um, Southern California, Michael Crow case, C-R-O-W-E, where you see how they break him down. I think he was 13 or 14. They break him down to the point where they convince him that he's murdered his younger sister and he can't remember it. And the moment where he has this oh my God, I killed my sister. I killed my sister. And he absolutely dissembles. He breaks down. And you see the power of the interrogation room and what they can do. Um, I'm surprised that there aren't more, frankly. Well, one thing that strikes me is that uh, pol police coercion that's used for the sake of uh, false for the sake of inducing a confession seems to be the same power that is often used to induce uh, false eyewitness testimony. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about that before we move on to our, our question and answer. Who wants to talk? Uh, I mean, what we know in the registry is that there are all sorts of problems with, uh, with uh, how witness eyewitness uh, identifications can be tampered with. Um, th there's a, um, a case that we just added to the registry, um, Arturo Jimenez. Um, uh, it's a California case, not a death case, um, where the, they basically had a witness where they said, I mean, she came into court and identified him and said she was 100% sure. But, you know, years later, she basically says, I really didn't know. Um, and they showed her photographic uh, arrays, lineups, and she couldn't pick anybody. And they basically said, you're not leaving until you pick someone. And so she picked the person that sort of most looked like what she thought it was. And it turned out to be this guy. Um, and they c essentially convinced her that she had the right person so that by the time she came to court, 
um, she thought she was doing the right thing. And th that happens fairly, well, it's hard just to put a frequency on it, but it, it happens more often than you'd like to think, where someone really has no idea, but they get persuaded. Um, they're, they're, they're shown a photograph. Someone, you know, puts their finger on, well, what do you think about this guy? Um, and uh, they're uh, rewarded by saying, well, I think it could be him. And it's like, you're right. It is him. You know, that sort of thing. Um, some of it is subtle. Some of it is blatant. Um, and there, we know that there are proven reforms that can be introduced to, that can really go a long ways toward preventing this. Um, and these reforms, uh, I think, have been shown that they don't lead to losing cases because people don't make the identifications. Um, what they do is they make the identifications that you get hold up and that they're legit, they're real. Right. So. Um, there are a number of questions that we have from our viewers about um, accountability and what can we do in your view? What can we do and how should we address issues of uh, prosecutor misconduct uh, as far as forensic evidence goes? I mean, how do we curtail the use of unreliable, unreliable forensic evidence? Um, what do we do to minimize false convictions? So I, I'm happy to start on this one. Please. Um, you know, there's a number of things. So right now, obviously, there's a big discussion about qualified immunity because that's what the standard is when you want to sort of hold a police officer accountable for misconduct. And the standard for qualified immunity is very high, very hard to prove. Um, and that's become part of the national conversation right now as we talk about reforming police and how we hold police accountable. What people don't seem to realize is that prosecutors have absolute immunity, meaning they cannot be held responsible for the actions that they take in their official capacity as a prosecutor, even when it's deliberate and even when it results in a wrongful conviction. People are astonished by that. They don't realize that there's this absolute bar. You cannot touch a prosecutor for their misconduct. That needs to change. Um, and so as we're talking about qualified immunity and what the standard really should be, um, we need to be also folding into the conversation this idea of absolute immunity, why it's there in the first place, and whether we need to reform that as well. Um, and the other piece, and Simon can, I'm sure, talk more about this, but one thing I also find really troubling is that we very rarely talk about the role of judges. Um, but judges have a function in the courthouse beyond sitting up there looking very serious. I mean, they are gatekeepers of evidence, and you should, judges should be excluding evidence that don't meet standards of reliability and accuracy. So if a prosecutor wants to put on evidence that just doesn't make sense, doesn't meet um, baselines of scientific reliability, it should be excluded. But judges are often not forensic experts, they don't retain their own experts, and they allow evidence into courtrooms that should never be there in the first place. Um, and that contributes to wrongful convictions. And one way to fix that is to make sure judges are doing their gatekeeping function um, and making sure that the evidence that is ever put before a jury is reliable and accurate. That's an interesting question or an, interest, an interesting point because jurors tend to believe forensic evidence. You know, they think that DNA is infallible. And if they hear someone, for example, in the case of uh, Cameron Todd Willingham, an expert who says this flame pattern suggests this and it can't be anything else, um, it seems to me that that's a problem. My question is what, you know, how is it that we address forensic evidence in a way that provides more reliability, and that results in more just outcomes and trials. Well, you know, um, there's a big debate over how best to regulate forensic science and improve it in the United States. And I, the, you know, one side of it is, to, as, as Jessica mentioned, to have judges do it. And so judges should restrict evidence unless it can demonstrate its reliability. 
And then the counter argument to that is that judges have done such a poor job um, at doing that because they seem unwilling to um, ever exclude forensic evidence if it doesn't meet their standards that we need to give up on them and have the government regulate it somehow. And that was the thinking behind the uh, creation of a National Commission on Forensic Science in 2013. Um, that was kind of a government regulatory body designed to improve forensic evidence kind of precisely because um, people had lost faith in the judiciary's ability to do that. And that lasted until um, Jeff Sessions became attorney general and that, that commission was then closed. Um, but, you know, I think, I think mainly we need to do two things with forensic evidence. We need to validate the techniques that we're using, find out how often they get the right answer, how often they get the wrong answer, put things on a sort of firm quantitative statistical basis. If you think of the Ford case with the gunshot residue, what, what you really need is somebody to say, um, you know, if you shot a gun and then you wait, you bring someone to the police station and you wait 24 hours and you test them for gunshot residue, what's the probability you'll test positive for gunshot residue? If you did not shoot a gun and then you're brought to the police station and you're there for 24 hours and you're tested for gunshot residue, what's the probability that you'll test positive for gunshot residue? And actually know those numbers as opposed to just saying, he had gunshot residue and you know what that means. Um, and then when you get to the pathologist's testimony, I think the thing people are concerned about is sort of fitting the forensic evidence to the government's theory of the crime. Um, so this is sometimes talked about as bias. And if it is, it's a perhaps kind of a subtle unconscious form of bias, but um, where you know, the, the science is kind of murky enough that you can make it fit what the government wants it to say. It's left hand at the time of death is around when you want it to be. Um, and uh, so we need measures to pre prevent that, um, which primarily would be by trying to remove forensic scientists from being oriented towards um, the prosecution either by removing labs from law enforcement, which is a common proposal, or other kinds of cultural changes to get um, forensic scientists to have a more neutral kind of um, attitude. I think a lack of resources for defense is a big issue in the forensic uh, arena. Um, and they, uh, in terms of hiring their own experts, doing independent testing, um, when you see the percentage of cases that are, and I don't know what it is, but it's high, that are being handled by already overworked and underfunded public defender offices who have some of the best lawyers in the country. Um, and, you know, you see where labs, you know, state police labs or labs affiliated with the prosecution, they won't even let them come in to watch the tests. Um, there's that, that kind of so I think there's an access issue to at least try to put things on a uh, even keel. Although I think what Simon is, is the real should be the real starting point. So you know, uh, just a final, uh, the, a final thought about this is you know prosecutors again just to go full circle here bear a significant responsibility in terms of the evidence they seek to put on in the first place. We know sort of conclusively, most folks who look at this stuff know that forensic odontology, for example, is just junk science. You cannot match someone's teeth print marks to a person. Um, and yet, they still want to introduce that evidence today in 2020. They're still looking to use that evidence, even though anybody who's really looked at it knows it's not reliable. Um, there needs to be, prosecutors need to have some sort of self-regulation about what they're even putting on in the first place. Um, because as we noted earlier, their job really shouldn't be to gain convictions. It should be to do justice. And uh, I mean, what opportunity is there for oversight of the forensic science profession? Well, Simon was referencing 
an attempt <laughs> that got dismantled by Jeff right. Sessions. Um, right. And there, you know, there is no national accreditation there of either labs, of labs themselves or of scientists who work in the labs. And there was some movement towards that, um, but it got disbanded. It's a lucrative, uh, it's, a, it's a really lucrative for some people. And when you say, okay, um, bite marks are junk and we shouldn't be putting them in the courtroom uh, at all, or even using it to try to solve a crime, um, you've got people whose livelihoods are being threatened. And so the pushback is pretty enormous on some of these things. Um, I think that there's been more of an acknowledgement in say the fire investigation community um, to use less of the, you know, well, you know, I lick a piece of, em of dead ember and then I t have a piece of bread and then I, you know, that kind of junk. Um, we're long past that. Um, I mean, we're, you know, exonerations face it, it's kind of an archeological dig where we're going into the past and looking at what happened 15, 25 years ago in some of these cases. And so um, I do think we've advanced in some, Simon can, can certainly speak to, to a lot more authoritatively on that, but there's some stuff that's just absolute. I mean, calling it junk is probably elevating it to a level that it shouldn't be. But, and also, can you speak to polygraph? Um, I practiced law in Colorado for a while, and uh, lawyers would frequently, as a term of probation, you know, sign their clients up to have to go and see the probation officer every month and give a polygraph. Um, it can, and polygraph is something we see on TV frequently. Can you address that? Um, well, you don't see, uh, you know, polygraph is, is sort of the one forensic science that's famously, that judges are willing to exclude. Um, uh, partly because of precedent, um, the main case on forensic evidence, the Fry case, and going back to 1923, was actually a polygraph case and it was excluded. Then um, I, I did have a student who wrote a paper arguing that the reason it's excluded so much is that it's usually offered by the defense um, because uh, the prosecution has learned that it's usually excluded. So it's often the defense that wants to introduce a, you know, a, a favorable polygraph result into evidence and then the judges don't, don't allow that. But it, it's, it's pretty rare that we see a polygraph result entered into evidence in a trial. Uh, we have a couple cases in the, in the registry, but, it, but it's rare because of this uh, exclusion issue. So it, it's much more of a factor in the pretrial activity, um, the interrogation. Um, and, and as you know, the polygraph is you know, not very reliable, um, but it can, can um, you know, be a useful thing in interrogation. Um, to go back to your false confession question, right? You failed a polygraph. Why'd you fail the polygraph in order to, to kind of help leverage a confession or even the notorious cases where you don't do the polygraph at all, put their palm on a Xerox machine uh, and push the button and the word lie comes out and then tell, um, tell the defendant that they failed a polygraph. Um, so I, I think that's mainly where we see it. It, 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 I find it interesting, and I really don't know what to make of it, where you see in some exoneration cases where they bring the case to the, to the DA's office and they look through it and they say, well, will your client take a, a polygraph? And so they want the, the person to take a polygraph, even though there's, it's not something, I just find it odd how it's used sometimes. And, you know, we're, we're writing up a case where a guy just got pardoned in, in the state of Oregon. He, he has taken and passed eight polygraphs over the years. He finally got a, a pardon based on in, innocence from Governor uh, Kate Brown. Um, and it was largely based on the fact that his daughter, who had accused him of the sexual abuse at age seven, um, has recanted and recanted repeatedly for the last five years and said, you know, her mother basically was a bad divorce case. Um, uh, and so I guess that counts for something, eight polygraphs. But 
I, I, it is, as Simon said, it's notoriously kind of unreliable. It does seem that there is, uh, as we look at these common aspects of criminal investigation and also criminal prosecution, we see a lot that smells like corruption. You know, it smells like self-dealing. And in the case where someone's life is on the line, as they are in capital cases, it seems like this is just an ultimate offense to justice. So, I mean, having said that, we only have a few minutes left, and I'd like each of you to wrap up and talk about innocence or the death penalty for whatever you think, just for a few moments so that um, our viewers can hear from the experts. So, Jessica? Um, you know, I've been a pretty outspoken death penalty abolitionist since I first learned about the death penalty. <laughs> In fact, one of my claim to fame is that there's a photo of me marching um, at a death penalty process in the New York Times back in the early 90s. So <laughs> that, that's part of my one minute of fame. Um, and, you know, the reasons for my opposition to the death penalty are many. Um, and they range, of course, from just the fact that every person I believe has human dignity. I don't believe people are the worst thing they've ever done. Um, because I think the system is rigged against the poor, that it is racist. Um, but I've come to also appreciate innocence as a really significant um, amplifier or explainer of what's wrong with the death penalty because I think it brings everybody to the table. As Simon said earlier, um, nobody, even people who are in favor of capital punishment in principle, nobody thinks an innocent person should be executed. And there's something fundamentally um, wrong with the democracy that allows our government to execute innocent people. And whether it's, you know, one in nine, or one in 25, or some number in the middle, um, we have an error rate that should make all of us incredibly uncomfortable when it comes to the death penalty. Um, and I'm really delighted that this conversation is happening. Um, and I think it feeds beautifully into a moment right now in 2020 that we maybe haven't seen before, um, where so many people are interested in criminal justice reform. And I think innocence and the death penalty should be a big part of that larger criminal justice reform conversation. Thank you. Maurice? I think that um, the, the death penalty system, if you want to call it that, is really a snapshot of the whole system. And it's just where the stakes are the highest and where um, the, 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 the stakes being the highest, it becomes more, even more winning and losing, but that's really what the system is largely based on, is winning and losing. And that's unfortunate because, um, the, you know, the, let's do justice. Well, um, let's not do all these things that people do, hide evidence, lie, cheat, um, with the idea that this is a guilty person. And so um, the means justify, or, you know, the ends justifies the, the means to getting there. Um, and when you've got, so I think that this is a, a microcosm of what's, of many problems within the cr criminal justice system. It's just that the result is, you know, if you find out you made a mistake and the person's dead, it's too late. And that's where it should be driving why we change, make change. Thank you. Simon? Um, I, I guess I just all of these discussions, I always want to remind people that, you know, we're talking about what we know and mostly what we know tells us about how much we don't know. And so how much is hidden and, and that we don't know about. And that these, when the interaction of innocence and the death penalty, as I said in my first remarks, um, it, you know, is sort of paradoxical in a way because in some sense the innocence um, expose the problems with the death penalty. And yet, on the other hand, as, as I said, you could take a look at a lot of those 127 cases or 170 and say, these are innocent people who we, we wouldn't know they were innocent if they hadn't gotten the death penalty, right? So been charged with the death penalty. So it's this uh, kind of paradoxical effect. It's really amazing, isn't it? 
Well, I have to thank you, and I have a number of people here who are thanking all of you and wishing you well. Thank you for enlightening us about this. Uh, this is a very critical issue. I hope to work with you again and see you again sometime. I have to put up my screen for one second. There we go. Um, yes, Death Penalty Focus is a nonprofit organization. We bring these events to you um, due to your contributions. So please help us. Uh, please join. Please see more of our webinars and stay tuned and um, you'll receive a message with a link to the recording of this. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.